Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I've been promising you an extra episode since September. Well, it never came off. I was all prepared to discuss the end of the war in the Pacific, but I struggled to pin down the guest. So I've had to give up on that one. But good things come to those who wait. I was asked if I might be interested in having a chat with the writer of the new World War II film, Darkest Hour. Anthony McCartan is the writer. Well, how could I say no? But just before we get to that, if you enjoy this, at the end, why not head over to patreon.com slash ww2podcast and become a supporter of the show. A dollar from each of you helps me to make more World War II content for, well, everyone. I have no corporate sponsor funding this project, just loyal listeners like yourself. So that's patreon.com slash ww2podcast. And I thank those who are already patrons of the show. So what you're about to hear next is the trailer to Darkest Hour and then my interview with Anthony. We must now select my successor and determine one man the opposition will accept. He stands for one thing and one thing only, himself. Why have I been forced to send for Churchill? This record is a catastrophe. Let me see your true qualities, your lack of vanity. Yeah, my lying will. Your sense of humour. Ho, ho, ho. Your Majesty. It is my duty to invite you to take up the position of Prime Minister of this United Kingdom. I speak to you for the first time as Prime Minister. The Germans have encircled 60 British and French divisions. We are looking at the collapse of Western Europe within the next few days. How long have they got if we don't rescue them? Maybe two days. We would need a miracle to get our men out. You have the full weight of the world on your shoulders. We're facing certain defeat on land, the annihilation of our army, and imminent invasion. We must negotiate peace talks. When will the lesson be learned? You cannot reason with a tiger when your head is in its mouth! Nonsense. The only slippery slope. Would you stop interrupting me while I am interrupting you? We have before us many, many long months of struggle and suffering. We will know many old and famous states have fallen into the grip of the Nazi rule. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender! For without victory, there can be no survival. I thought it was absolutely superb. So I wonder if, if the start point would be, if you could give us a quick sort of the elevator pitch, the premise of the film. It's essentially we look at uh, only four weeks of uh, Churchill's life and trying to really distill, you know, the contents of such an incredible life. Like he lived about you know, four or five lives and squeeze them into one. And and now we're trying to, I'm trying to sort of squeeze the essence of who he was into four weeks. The reason for choosing those four weeks is that uh, about 10 years ago, I realized that he he had written um, three of the greatest speeches ever written and delivered within a four week period. And that period was from May 10th, 1940 um, through to Dunkirk, which was uh, the first week of June, 1940. Uh, I always wondered, firstly, how, why, where did he write those the, um, those amazing speeches in such a short space of time? And secondly, I wanted to do a, a portrait in leadership anyway. Um, and he just became the kind of um, poster boy for the proposition that words matter, that they count, and that they can change the world. And in this period in history, in this little window, um, he really, the, the words he chose and wrote and delivered um, really did make a difference. I really think they changed the the, the, um, the, the, the destiny of, of the world, the human story. 
indeed and the, as, as you point out those script those those speeches have really stayed with us you know how much do you feel when you're writing something like this that you have to pamper to the p- perceived historical narrative because presumably you know this these bits people feel should be put put in which you know is that a difficult process um yeah it's i mean my my view on that is that pedestals are for statues and, and i i wanted the opposite thing i wanted to, to to show him in all his flaws and and to um you know to present the um the, the discoveries i personally made when i did research um which were whole new aspects of churchill i'd never seen really represented in in film at least um his his sense of humor uh which was enormous uh, i don't know how you can present a portrait of winston without showing a sense of humor an extremely witty man a, a romantic man also um so a very very passionate love affair with his with his the wife the love of his life and and importantly um History has given us only a, a Winston that that never had doubts, never had to battle with uncertainty and so forth. Um, but a, a reading of the of the minutes of the War Cabinet of that month show a man who, on the crucial issue of whether to do a peace deal with Adolf Hitler or not, changed his position by the day and sometimes by the hour. And this uncertain um, Winston seemed an altogether more human man. Than than I than had been previously allowed. So uh, while honouring history at every step, I personally, but everyone involved with the film, we we strained every sinew to to do justice to the facts. Um, we also wanted to you know present uh, information about him that that I don't think we've seen before, which which actually makes him grow in stature in my mind than that diminish him. Yeah, indeed. I, I mean, I, I made, I had a note here to ask you about, you know, his insecurities, and I think that 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 was probably undoubtedly very genuine. And I don't really know how, if you're doing that job, you can and do it without you know, the, the insecurities. And 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 you mentioned Clementine. You know, she's rarely get to mention when you look at the big Churchillian history of the war. Um, I mean, how how important do you think she was to his leadership? Well, I think given he was quite a tempestuous person, and, and his, his moods would rise and fall, and and she was a steadying influence on him, and and someone he could at the end of every day, you know, talk through the issues, and 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 she w- was a keen intellect. He credited her with being the sort of enabler, the one who, without whom, he doesn't feel he could have achieved what he did. All of us with um, clever partners, you know, know what that's like. It's it's a sounding board. It's it's a it's an it's a rock. It's it's an emotional um, outlet. Um, and she performed all those functions uh, for him. He was not an easy man to live with, I'm sure. But she was also similarly quite highly strung. But they were they were together, despite their you know their testy personalities they they proved to be a magnificent match for each other mm. I, I, there is a book somewhere isn't there about the le- their their letters to one another and i thought having read that at some point in the past i thought you seem to portray their relationship wonderfully it, very much to the essence of how i read those uh, letters to one another yeah um, a great tenderness um he he used to refer to her as cat and she rather affectionately called him pig um, if we look at his speeches and uh, did he write his speeches himself. He doesn't, you know, doesn't have such a modern thing as a script writer. Uh, a script writer. No, he did not. No, he wrote them all himself. And he he had been a student of of the power of rhetoric and a, a, a lifelong believer in the in the power of of, of words to to shift people out of fixed positions if they were the right words. And it goes back to his early twenties when he would studied all the Greeks and and. Um, and uh, and the Romans, especially Cicero and and Cicero's rules of rhetoric, and and in his twenties he actually wrote a um, he wrote a, an essay called the Scaffolding of Rhetoric, where he he broke down this um, what he saw as the essential techniques of of um, of um, lifting people up um, through 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 their message and repeating phrases and so forth, uh, like anaphora, which is repetition of key words like fight them on the beaches, uh, or fight them on the landing grounds, or victory at all costs. And he used those um, those techniques really, really um, masterfully in, in May 1940. Um, how, you know, how, how, was you, how were the speeches received at the time? Do you think people appreciated 
the power of them. Yeah, I th- I, especially the, the the last one, the fight them on the beaches and stuff. Apparently, he he sort of delivered delivered a kind of uh, draft version to his outer cabinet earlier in the day, and um, it, it, their reaction had been critical in his decision to resist the pressure from his from his uh, war cabinet to do a peace deal. And then he, with with that in mind, he then went into the chamber and delivered this magnificent piece of of rhetoric. We we only have diary entries about how well it went down, but apparently a storming success. Um, there was no broadcast of that speech. Our record of it, our recording of it, was recorded after the war, when we filmed that scene. Gary Oldman uh, performed in front of 500 extras, and it was you, you really got the sense of what it would have been like on that day. You really had to belt it out to get your message to the you know to the back back rows and so forth. The rather mannered version that we that we that Winston recorded, we believe from his bed. And the BBC came and recorded it in his bed. Probably is a very poor version of what he delivered on that day. So I think we we probably come closer to the sort of theatrics that he uh, that he unleashed. I was aware that there were re-record, but obviously if you're in Parliament, it, it's a very different speech delivery than necessarily when you re-record them after the war. Uh, very, a very sort of different type of oratory rather than just sort of reading it. You really have to sort of perform the speech. Yeah, um, absolutely. Well, it is. It's the actor, and and you know he loved cinema. He loved the theatre, and so he w- he would have had to stand there and really get his diaphragm engaged and and belt that out. And you can only imagine that, you know, the gestures he would have employed physically and and the, and the vocal power and so forth. Um, so Gary, who's, you know, um, very experienced in the theatre, used those techniques in the movie. And and we, we think that's much closer to what would have, what what the uh, the MPs would have heard that day. It, it, certainly in the trailer, the, 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 the snippets that they show, it just looks absolutely magnificent. And Gary Oldman, if you, 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 I would have never have guessed that that was Gary Oldman. He just, just fits the Churchillian look perfectly. Yeah. Absolutely remarkable. Yeah. Um, absolutely remarkable. Well, it's quite a, quite a story, actually. Gary um, had worked with a, a makeup artist, a prosthetics genius called Casahiro, on a previous film. A kazoo, as Gary calls him, was responsible for the makeup for um, Benjamin Button as well. Won an Oscar, I believe, for that. And Gary said, "I won't do this movie without Kazoo because I need to. When I look in the mirror, I need to see Winston Churchill looking back at me." So after many months of laboring and sculpting and molding, Kazoo started to come up with this 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 face. It's not even a mask; it's it's an alternate face. And they used to apply it. Took four hours to apply it every morning, and um, rolled this thing on. And it was like human flesh. And Gary did, ostensibly disappeared, and we we didn't see him again till the end of the movie. And it was just it was Winston Churchill, and he, Gary would plonk himself down. I should say Winston Churchill would plonk himself down beside me, you know, on the set every day and speak with a sort of West, uh, East End accent, um, <laughs> puffing away on a cigar, and then go back on the set. Um, it was it was rather sort of. <laughs> it sounds surreal. Um, how, how difficult did you find it to write dialogue for Churchill? I mean, he's such a wordsmith. Yeah. Or does it sort of write itself? Yeah. No. No. Quite the opposite. Um, I had, as I say, I had the initial idea about ten years ago, but I really put it off because the intimidation factor of writing for Winston was so huge. I, I thought, oh my God, it, you know, that's not something you want to get wrong, um, because you know Churchill remains kind of sacred ground, and you have to walk very carefully on it. Everyone has their own version of the man. So it was it was only really after the success of Theory of Everything I'd had such a happy experience on that that I I felt a little more emboldened. So I thought, you know, what I'll just roll the dice and you know what's the worst that can happen is I can embarrass myself here. Um, and so I started to you know just read a lot of his uh, writing, listen to whatever I could. Um, there's a few clips of him talking and so forth. Try to absorb his vocabulary, which was fast. Um, his his style of of speech, you know, I read all his witticisms and one-liners and and the way he constructed them. This is sort of an a, an Oscar Wildean kind of quality to his humour. 
And I just, you, in the end, you have to kind of play ventriloquist. You hope you hope you have it in your resources to sort of pull that off. So the script is a, is a, is you know it's largely invented, but uh, but there's there's lines of his of Winston's that are threaded through, but ostensibly the majority of the dialogue and and the, even the jokes uh, are mine. The, the the two great speeches are of course Winston's, but there's a third speech in the middle in which we only have a partial record from because it was never it was an off the cuff speech. And we only have some key lines that were were diarized by people who were in the room. So I've kind of done fifty percent of that speech, and it's all very, very presumptuous to 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 you know to write speeches for Winston Churchill. But but that was my task. So I just hope I've acquitted myself reasonably well. I, I would have never have guessed that you hadn't got a transcript and cut them all together. You know, short, shortened his actual real life. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. So. Yeah, there's many great lines attributed to him. Um, you know, have you got in your favourite ones? You've certainly got in one of my favourite phrases, which is KBO, keep buggering on. But I mean, do you have a personal favourite you managed to uh, get in or could you just not fit in some of your favourites? No, we uh, we actually shot a few of my favourites. Um, um, the one about um, Madame and um, uh, in the morning I'll be sober. You know, the... Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, the classic. I, yeah, the classic. I, I am drunk and you are ugly. Yeah, uh, sir, you are drunk, and he said, "Yes, madam, but you are ugly, and it, you are ugly, and in the morning I'll be sober." Yeah, and when we had the, we also had the one um, where uh, he apparently had been invited by George Bernard Shaw to an opening night of a play in the West End. His secretary um, read out George Bernard Shaw's invitation letter, which said something like. Um, dear Mr. Churchill, please, I'd love you to attend. Please bring a friend if you have one. To which Winston replied, Dear Mr. Shaw, would love to attend. We'll come to your second night uh, if you have one. <laughs> <laughs> which is just wicked, wickedly good. But, um, you know, we'd, if you were to just make the whole movie a, a, a sort of omnibus compendium of, of his one-liners, it would all seem like a greatest hits album. So... We had we had bigger fish fish to fry, but but we've got a couple of his absolute beauties in there, like um, the king asking him, "Sir, how do you manage drinking during the day?" And the long pause, beautifully judged by Gary, and then he replies, "Practice." Wait, I hadn't realised that was a that was an actual quote. That's wonderful. This so actually the, 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 those the, some good king quotes, um, which I, 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 the the one I I only made two quotes. Notes of quotes, and one's in the trailer. I hadn't realised until I rewatched the trailer. Which will you stop interrupting me while I am interrupting you? Which I'm sure my wife would like to shout at me at some time. Um, but uh, I quite I like the Queen saying, "One never knows what one, what is going to come out of your mouth next." Something that will flatter or wound, and I thought that was wonderful as well. Yeah, <laughs> which is sort of in the spirit of that uh, George Bernard Shaw uh, quote. Yeah. So, how much do you think Churchill? And I'm not quite sure how to phrase this. I was going to say, took the country to war, led the country to war, makes him sound like a warmonger, and I, you know, he's, he's, he's not. It does, yeah. But, but they're very bombastic speeches. Yeah, they are. They are bombastic. But but he was fortified in his position by his knowledge that the public were behind him, um, and that was critical in his decision to resist the internal pressure of his cabinet. Polls were coming out in May 1940 that were showing overwhelming support by the, by the people, especially the working classes, um, to fight on, even though the odds were very, very slim. And and knowing that and having this unerring ability to take the pulse of the public and being quite unique in that, I mean, that that message was, was kind of lost on many of his colleagues. He felt he had the mandate to, to get up and stand and, and make those speeches that we will fight, we will make those sacrifices. So he really was, um, um, he wasn't a pipe piper leading people over a cliff. Um, he was he was giving voice to, to the public sentiment and this public mood. I, I only have sort of two questions to go, which is which is great because we haven't got long left. But there, there is a, there's another speech he delivers. I had really hadn't realised that all these speeches had come out so close to one another because there's uh, the fi- finest hour is delivered on the 18th of June, which is just beyond the end of the film. Yeah. It is. Uh, it is. I, I wondered. I wondered if you'd. I wondered if you'd felt that. You know, that perhaps if you could have just stretched it a little bit further, you could have got, <laughs> got that in as well. You know, we have to make room for a sequel somehow. Um, <laughs> and 
I, I thought it's, I mean, this this movie is about bringing Britain back from the brink, bringing the, bringing the world back from the brink. The, the finest hour speech, although, again, majestic in its phraseology and things, is, um, that's a victory speech. Um, and um, and we're very much the thriller. This movie's a kind of um, ticking, ticking clock thriller over a very short, tight speech space of time indeed it, 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 it's funny but it's funny you call it a victory speech it is a victory speech yet it's delivered five years before the victory m- m- you know, finally you're from you're from new zealand i wonder if that helped you know perhaps weighed down with less churchill baggage um i think perhaps or perhaps it's um that i that i felt freer to sort of take a new view on him but i grew up very much under the churchill myth as well my father um he was born in 1921, um, and um, he had served in, in both the Italian theatre and the North African theatre. So Churchill was very much a, a big figure around our house growing up, a, a sort of icon of, of the quality of leader that thereafter, you know, everyone else was found wanting when compared to. So I, I was bringing sort of my own baggage. But I really went into it with an open mind. I, I, I said, well, when I dive into the research, I'll just let the facts speak for themselves. And the facts were very outspoken. And I was delighted. The more I researched, the more I saw dimensions of him, which I just thought have never seen the light of day. I mean, most representations of Churchill have this, this really moody Grinch who walks around in a, a fog of cigar smoke and barks out instructions and a man who was born in a bad mood and it didn't capture his light or his his the, the mischief in him that's ma- that's made him so beloved I, I i hope i've done done well enough and i'm encouraged by the response of the family um even the grand churchill grandchildren who actually knew him as teenagers and they you know they they sort of wave their finger at me and say how did you do it how did you get him so um that's that's really encouraging that we may have got as close as anyone's ever got to capturing the spirit of the guy. Well, as I say, I think you've done marvellously. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. I, it had just those those perfect Churchillian bits where you know the, those speeches get the hairs on the back of your neck, and it, it, you know it's a wonderful roller coaster ride going through. When I was reading it, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So, you know, thank you very much. Uh, it was great, and I can't cannot wait to see it uh, when it's thank released. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the, the <laughs> movie as much as the script. Good to speak with you. Yeah, that was my 30 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you for putting up with my waffle. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. It was a great pleasure. You take care now. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Bye-bye. So there you are. I hope you enjoyed that. The film is Darkest Hour. I will put a link to the trailer on the website. Gary Ullman really does look absolutely great as Churchill. We'll be back to normal in the next episode, uh, looking at the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in 1935 and those men who went to fight for Haile Selassie. If you want to do some background reading, I suggest you pick up a copy of Evelyn War's Scoop. Don't forget to become a patron and help me continue producing the podcast. It's patreon.com slash ww2podcasts. I'm Angus Wallace. And thanks for listening.